the Christian response to the problem of evil and suffering was perhaps best summarized by the Apostle Paul. Two decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul described the persecution Christians endured and the hope that sustained them as they preached the gospel throughout the first century Roman world. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He refers to these things as momentary light affliction. What, Paul, are you crazy? Momentary light affliction? But we understand when we read further, because he goes on to explain that these are momentary light afflictions in comparison to something else, because these afflictions, and he's very particular about his words, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And you see, there's this subtle theme through the New Testament that helps us understand this problem of evil as followers of Christ, that God can cause all these things to work for good in our lives because we love him, we're called according to his purpose. And these have a transforming impact on us so that when we get to heaven, we are actually different people than we would have been if we had not gone through these things. These momentary light afflictions are producing for us the eternal weight of glory. If you only lived this life four score and 10 and then you died and that was the end of it, the kind of hostilities and hurts that we have in this life would be writ large. Their significance would be stunning indeed. But from the vantage point, of life forever with God in heaven. The harms and hurts that happen to us in this life, though still real and still important, are shown to be so insignificant compared to the glories and the joys we're going to experience in the afterlife that from the vantage point of that perspective, they are well, well worth it. In 1998, I was at a conference and met a young man named Mark Herringer. Mark was from Boston and we became good friends. One night we were driving to the airport and he told me about a tragedy that his family had suffered five years earlier. I'll never forget Mark's story because it demonstrated so powerfully the importance of what the hope of heaven can really mean. It was January 16th of 1993. In Boston, it snows a lot, and so you're shoveling your driveway constantly. We had gone to the uh, supermarket that morning, and while we were at the supermarket, it was actually snowing. So I got home kind of irritated and said, uh, honey, why don't you park the car out in the street here? Uh, I'll just uh, clean off the driveway. And our two kids were with us, uh, our son, uh, three years old, and our daughter, Lauren, who was 18 months old. I jumped out of the car, got a shovel, the kids jumped out with me, and I asked my wife to move the car to an to a, a easier spot for us to clean out the driveway, and she did, and she said, make sure you keep an eye on the kids. And my son immediately went with her into the car, and my daughter was with me uh, for a few moments. Uh, but what I hadn't realized was that she actually wanted to be in the car also. And so as my daughter was running to the car, she uh, was uh, trapped under the front wheel of the car. There was a brief uh, scream of pain, and, uh, and I immediately ran out. And uh, to any parent's horror, uh, they see their 18-month-old uh, daughter under the front wheel of a 2,000 pound car was overwhelming. She died instantly, as we found out later. Um, I actually took the uh, last breath that she ever breathed on this earth out of her lungs. And we um, drove to the emergency room at the hospital, hoping and uh, praying that things might be different, but they weren't. And um, within an hour or so, they had pronounced her uh, dead. I 
I was very angry at God. I didn't know why he would uh, choose me. And my mind would race and think, what is this all about? Where am I going? What does this all mean? Do I take my life? Do I uh, go through a divorce? We had a 97% uh, a failure rate within the first two years when there's a death of a child and the pa parental uh, involvement. Um, what would that mean? Would that, would that bring some closure to that? What would be a life of anger and despair uh, at God? Those options are, are not good ends. The struggle during our pain here was I had to make a decision. Am I going to accept or reject this situation that I'm in based on not knowing the end game or not knowing the, all the answers? I was given a Bible, my very first Bible, on Christmas three weeks before uh, the accident. And that Bible was to become the thing that kept me alive. There were drugs and uh, various things that people gave us to try to calm us down during this difficult few weeks, but it was actually holding the Bible and reading it was the thing that actually comforted me the most. Um, I actually slept with my Bible for about nine months every night. What I was struggling for was the reality of Jesus, the reality of somebody who knew suffering, who was going to be there, who uh, had experienced this himself. I spent a lot of time actually in cemeteries just walking around and uh, found some comfort there. I could oftentimes connect more closely with pain there because I knew that everybody there had a story and that people uh, had come and grieved there. It gave me a clarity that Jesus works powerfully in places where people are hurting. And so I found great comfort to just be quiet and listen to him there. And so um, sometimes I would just go around and read the, uh, the, the stone markers and um, uh, pray for the various families. And it actually turned from, a, from an internal thing where I was trying to get uh, healing and hope to a place where I would actually intercede for others. And that was a shift that occurred where God began to do a work that uh, my healing was gonna be uh, more complete in helping others. We had five neighbors who lived next to us, directly next to us when the accident happened. And within five years, three whole families of those households came to know Christ personally. And when I think back on where we were and how God used that, I said, that doesn't make it all right. That doesn't make it good. That doesn't make my pain go away. But it does tell me that God is bringing some good out of this, that there'll be some eternal good that comes out of her life and death. Your answer at this tough time is you are naked, you are stripped down raw. You have to make a decision. Which road are you gonna take? Where are you gonna go in your faith? And I think evil and suffering drive us to those points where we have to make those naked decisions. We have to make those um, raw decisions that give us nowhere out, no, no, nothing to hold on to. We're just there before him. And that's what real faith, I think, is. Not knowing the future, but understanding enough now to make a decision that will change the future in our lives. If I look at it through my own experience, I think I would drive it to the point to say that God is in control of all things and nothing is beyond his reach, nothing is beyond his ability to control. The joy is, is knowing that this is just temporary, that there's something much more. The eternal perspective changes things because it takes the focus off of my experience now and puts it in a different level, a different realm. The Bible says uh, heaven will be a place where there's no more tears or pain or crying or death. Okay, so if, if that's true, then the hope is, is that these things will be resolved and that, that we'll understand or we'll have more clarity that we don't have now. The greatest hope is, is that one day I'll walk with her in heaven. She'll be perfect. And I'll be full of joy. And this life will have made a lot more sense. 
because sometimes it doesn't, but I have that hope. Yeah.